live again for day five question and answer period. So today was about dimensionality reduction and I am very excited to have not only the creator of the tutorials uh, with us today, um, Alex Geiko uh, Gajic, and uh, but we also have um, Kenneth Harris and um, Christian um, um, Machens with us. Say again. So today was about dimensionality. Oh, sorry, this is. <laughs> I am very excited to have it's playing back YouTube. because I'm checking the YouTube stream. Okay, the YouTube stream works. This is the good news. Ah. Um, excuse me about that. <laughs> and I'm going to actually paste the YouTube stream into the um, chat window here for those of uh, us who have um, not such a good internet connection. And that way, everyone can follow along because Crowdcast is a little bit greedy in terms of bandwidth. OK, sorry about that. So so, um, so uh, Alex is uh, a uh, um, neural theory professor at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in uh, Paris, in France. Um, uh, Christian Machens is a principal investigator at the Jean Palimau Institute in Lisbon. And uh, Kenneth Harris is a professor in quantitative neuroscience at University College London. Um, so I'd like to ask you, um, all of you, to briefly introduce yourselves, maybe, and, and maybe tell us something about why you think uh, dimensionality reduction is really useful, or maybe you have an anecdote about it, something you would like to share um, with our students. So uh, why, why don't I go reverse and ask uh, Christian maybe to start? All right. Um, yeah, my name is Christian Markens from Champagne Moore. Um, and why do I like dimensionality reduction? I think it's easy. Uh, when I was a postdoc in uh, Carlos Brody's lab at the time, I got access to data from Anulfo Romo. These were electrophysiological recordings in the prefrontal cortex, uh, you know, a thousand cells or something like this. And my first response there was to say, okay, you know, cool, I have to look at the data. So I plotted. So I computed, you know, PSDHs, various stimulus time histograms, um, two cells per page. And then I sent it to the printer, and I came back with 500 pages of cells. And I looked at them one by one. I literally did that, actually. OK, I could have maybe saved some paper. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit. But you know, you go through all of those cells one by one, and it's kind of interesting. It's informative. But after a while, you sort of say, OK, I have to do something else. OK, I'm not getting the picture here. And then the first thing I did is I ran PCA, which I guess many of you uh, learned about this morning. Um, and I wouldn't say that, you know, doing PCA, PCA was then sort of cool because it gave a different picture of the, of the data. It was very intriguing. It wasn't exactly that I could say, now I understand what's going on with the data. That's a more difficult question. But it was sort of my step into the general theme of dimensionality reduction. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Kenneth, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Hi, so I'm Kenneth Harris, uh, former mathematician, now neuroscientist at University College London. Um, the reason I like dimensionality reduction is that it optimizes the bandwidth of um, getting information from the data into your brain. Uh, because we are, you know, as humans, we are visual creatures. And if you want to understand something, looking at a 2D plot is one of the fastest ways uh, to, to, to do that, to get an intuition for what's going on. So, uh, and I guess this was Christian's uh, point as well. On the other hand though, I'd, I'd like to raise a, a counterpoint, um, which is that dimensionality reduction is of limited use when, um, when it comes to proving and disproving hypotheses. So you can do a dimensionality reduction and there are so many different methods of doing it, and, and every method can make your data look different. And the methods are almost often designed to make your data look a certain way. So if you apply a certain method and it looks a certain way, um, you may uh, think uh, that that's how the data is, but you've then got to do uh, confirmatory statistics. And for those, um, it is better not to use dimensionality reduction to work on the raw data without having done dimensionality reduction. Great, thank you so much. Those are some wise words. Alex. Um, hi, I'm Alex. Uh, I guess you guys already um, saw me in the tutorials. Um, I'm at ENS, uh, and I'm also a former mathematician, and I agree with what uh, Ken and Christian said. Um, I guess there's just 
too much data. Uh, and so dimensionality reduction is very useful. <laughs> <laughs> My answer, but I do, but you can also see things that you wouldn't necessarily see if you just plotted, like even if you could plot a, I don't know, thousand dimensional space. There are methods like JPCA, for example, where you could look for specific dynamics that are not so obvious. They might not like take the entire, uh, capture a lot of the variance of the data, for example. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, let's start asking questions. Just a reminder again to, uh, to our students and also TAs to please fill out the daily reflections. They're super important for us. Um, okay, and we're ready for questions. So the first question is by Kevin Luxem. And Kevin asks, does the brain operate on a lower dimensional manifold or multiple manifolds between brain areas? Or is dimensional re dimensionality reduction just a way to make the complexity of neural activity more tangible? Who would like to give that a shot? Uh, well, I'll start um, and with the answer that I don't think we know um, uh, because we, the amount of data needed to answer that question is, is vast. So I, I, I can tell you something from our work, which is that it doesn't lie on a low dimensional plane, right? So if, if you ask, is there a flat manifold, a plane where the data is uh, confined, as far as we can tell, the answer to that one is no. That doesn't mean that it doesn't lie on a curved manifold, um, but my honest view is it, it probably doesn't lie on anything like that at all, but maybe more something uh, something where the amount of variance in, in successive dimensions is progressively smaller. So I think the, the idea of a, of a manifold is, is a very useful one to have, uh, but it's always gonna be an approximation. Anyone like to add to that? Um, so one thing I want to add is uh, I agree with Ken. We don't really know, um, but we can study similar phenomena in simple network models. And I think, then broadly speaking, there are kind of two explanations for why you would find sort of low-dimensional manifolds in brain data. One explanation is you know that, for instance, connectivity in brain circuits has a special form. Mathematically, you can often just use low rank connections to get all the dynamics in your network to become low dimensional. That's the easiest way. The alternative to that is to just assume, you know, that it's always in the initial conditions of your network. So that the reason you see low dimensional activity is simply because we're not studying the network in all possible dynamical regimes. So those are the two possible answers, mathematically speaking. And then I think the question which it is, is still open. Anyone wants to add something to that? How would we even figure this out? Like what would be a signature of a brain operating in a low dimensional manifold? How would we figure that out? And like, well, and even like, can't we figure that out experimentally somehow? Well, you need to give some perturbations and you would need to see that perturbations always, you know, decay along certain dimensions. That's what I would suggest, for instance. If you see that you know if there are certain perturbations that you do and they always decay, um, then you could say maybe there's a low dimensional manifold. I mean, I, I think the, the question is actually ill-defined, to be honest, because uh -huh. taken at the literalist mathematical level, we know the answer, and the answer is no. Because anything, any question about biology, when you define it strictly and mathematically, the answer is going to be no. Because 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 biology just doesn't ever follow anything except to an approximation. So I think the question is, to what degree of approximation can neural activity be approximated by certain manifolds? Yeah, I think that is a good answer to that. Alex, any other thoughts? Um, I also think it depends on what you really mean by high or low dimensional. I mean, it's probably true that I mean, almost certainly true that the brain, like neural activity is not whatever, 86 billion dimensional, um, but it's probably also not two dimensional. So it's, you know, something, I think that what constitutes high or low dimensionality is really going to uh, vary uh, based on the scientific question that you're asking. Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah, Go ahead. I have to only say that we say low dimensional, but we're never very specific what we mean. So I guess you can say there's some type of uh, factor between the number of neurons and the number of dimensions. It's called the redundancy of the system. And then we don't know where to put that number. It's like 10, 100, 1,000. We don't really know. The, the other question is what we mean by dimensionality. So there, there are multiple definitions. So um, in you can ask about a, a planar dimension. You can ask about the curved dimension of a manifold. But even just for those, in practice, there are different ways to to ass assess them. So, for example, if you're talking about planar dimension, you could be very strict and say if there's any variance, um, then outside of that plane, then it doesn't count as low dimensional. Or you can use these uh, methods that people do based on the, the eigenvalues, the, the sum of squares and the sum of the eigenvalues, to get a number that approximates the dimension, even though in, in reality it's, it's infinite dimensional, because the variances decay at a certain rate, you can give a number of a dimensionality, sort of like an average dimension. I'm actually blanking on what the name of this quantity is. I think the participation ratio? Participation, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, which is a different quantity. So, so even the, the question needs to be defined. And I think the way the field's going to move forward is when we start saying exactly what we mean. So, so, so if I can ramble on a bit with an analogy, you can imagine some, some paleontologists getting into an argument over whether dinosaurs are reptiles. Um, but at the end of the day, it just depends how you define those words. Yeah. So, I mean, a related question sort of to, uh, and I don't think we know the answer, is how high dimensional is our behavior? Right? Mm. Because that would give us at least an idea of the kind of number of dimensions that the brain has to be able to deal with if it is actually low dimensional. Well, I mean, in, in terms of muscle control, uh, it, there are, it, it's a good analogy because there are these approximate low dimensional um, approximations, um, listings law, what, what have you, uh, that says the eye doesn't twist. Um, but again, they're only approximate. Yep. I think you have to consider time as well in that case. Because, you know, um, the brain activity, that the state of your brain activity now may determine your motor behavior, you know, several seconds or maybe minutes into the future. And so uh, the question is, you know, how do you measure the dimensionality of behavior? You also have to factor in time. So it, you cannot just look at, the, at an instantaneous moment, I think. Great. Thank you so much. Let's take another question. Um, this question is by Emmer Jones. It's a long question, um, so please bear with me here. Uh, could you offer some intuition on perplexity in TSNE? I understood roughly that it controls local versus global focus. When varying perplexity in MNIST example, too small was problematic, but so too was too large. In brackets, some MNIST numbers were only clustered well with uh, middling perplexity. Um, what is the trade-off here? Why do some numbers clusters? Why do some numbers cluster poorly with small or large perplexity? How should one choose a perplexity by trying a few values and seeing which produce meaningful slash useful clusters? Question mark. Who would like to give that a shot? I guess this is a question for me, sort of. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is kind of my fault for not having. Uh, a very crisp answer at the end of that tutorial. But the reason is because it is very complicated. So perplexity technically, I think is like two to the entropy. Uh, and, um, but the perplexity, so there's a really good distill paper that I linked to in the bottom of the tutorial um, for why uh, the results can change. But it's, I wouldn't really, um, the problem with TSNE is that you also can't, uh, take too literally the distance between uh, clusters. So uh, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. So if you have like cluster one versus cluster three are further than cluster one versus cluster like two, that's not necess uh, necessarily meaning that the, the distance is larger. Um, so the answer is that perplexity is two to the entropy, but I don't have a very good uh, intuition 
Sorry. <laughs> I'm perplexed. Uh, in, in my experience of TSNE, I completely agree with the question asker, which is that you just experiment with different values until you get yeah. a good result. Which, which unfortunately in, in data science, with many, with many techniques, this is sort of like the case, right? Yeah. How many layers should a neural network have, et cetera, et cetera. There are some rough ideas, but, but very often you just have to experiment. And can I say, this is exactly why, if, if you're doing a confirmatory analysis, now, rather than just visualizing the data to get a feeling for what's going on, you're trying to prove or disprove a hypothesis, this is why it's good not to use dimensionality reduction because the answers can depend on the exact choices of your parameters. And, and that's never a good thing when you're trying to prove a hypothesis. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so the next question is by Yun Huang. Can you name one or several applications of PCA whitening in neuroscience research? Well, one application um, of PCA whitening is if you want to do ICA. So you first start with PCA to widen the data and then, and then other applications, I mean, anytime you would want to, sorry, when I say ICA, like that could be useful for, because I didn't actually say neuroscience examples, that could be useful for EEG um, uh, or other types of like, uh, I think you could also use it for spike sorting possibly. Um, and uh, other, I mean, applications of whitening for like, whitening the statistics of visual images, if you're interested in um, higher order statistics, for example. Those are a couple, couple examples. Yeah, so ICA stands for independent component analysis, and it's often used, um, Alex mentioned in EEG, uh, it's often used for artifact rejection, for example. Ken, you wanted to add something? Um, yeah, I was actually gonna suggest spike sorting, which Alex already mentioned, but, um, uh, another another one is 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 just if you've got population activity, if you've recorded, you know, thousands of neurons, PCA is a good way to um, to to if, if anything else, just make the data easier to handle. Oh, let me let me point out another one actually. Uh, wide field calcium imaging. Um, so you, you're taking a view of the 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 brain activity with a calcium indicator. Um, you, you've got you know, thousands of pixels. Processing this data is really hard, uh, but if you apply PCA, you're just reducing the size of the data and you're also denoising it at the same time. So there's one there's one point though to emphasize here, which is that the, the, there's two types of PCA. One is when you do the whitening, which is, is, is what you heard of. And when you do that, every component has the same variance, but also you can do a, a version where you, you, you do the whitening and then you multiply each component by um, the standard deviation uh, of, of that component. And now you have something that isn't a whitened version of the data, it's an approximation to the original data. And the reason you do this, let's take the example of, um, of, of wide field imaging. So the, the first few principal components capture most of the, the largest fraction of the variance. By the time you're down to the hundreds of, of components, it's actually quite a small fraction of the variance. If you whiten the data, you've now given those small parts, which are largely noise, as much weight as the most important parts. So if you instead multiply them by the standard deviation of those components, what you've got now is an approximation to the original data in a rotated space, which doesn't matter. It's denoised and it's much smaller. So it's much easier to work with. And again, in this example of, of wide field imaging, you can do most of the analyses you want to do on wide field imaging, like say taking a spike triggered average, a stimulus triggered average, using the data to predict the behavior. You can do all of these things on the PCA compressed data um, with exactly the same code as you would with the original data. So, uh, so this is quite a useful um, uh, trick to have uh, and you can also use it for neural activity. So if you've recorded 10,000 neurons, you could take the first thousand uh, dimensions uh, and, and then use that as your, your activity vector. As long as you do this trick of multiplying each component by the, 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 um, the standard deviation of its variance. Yeah, so in the, in the chat, you might have noticed that uh, some people are asking what PCA whitening is. Does anyone briefly want to give a quick summary? 
you sort of already said it, but maybe just to re-emphasize what that actually is. Uh, well, I mean, so so if you if you run in in Python or MATLAB uh, a singular value decomposition, you get. Um, did, Alex, did you cover singular value decomposition? Uh, no, I did not. I didn't use. I use the eigen uh, eigenvalue of the. Okay. So it's it's a different way of of doing the same thing. Basically, it's just a different algorithm yeah. to do the same thing. Uh, you, you get these three outputs: U, S, V, and the point is that your original matrix equals U times S times V transpose, uh, where U is N by the number of rows of your original matrix, so the number of time points in your data, by the number of components. S is a diagonal matrix telling you the variance of each of those components. And V is the, um, the, um, is, is, is the other side of the matrix, which is number of components uh, sorry, number of, of 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 neurons by number of components. Say, uh, and and now if you if you take s times v, that's your approximation of uh, the one where it's weighted by the variance. Whereas if you just take v on its own, that's the one that's whitened. So whitened means that every one of the uh, components is uh, uncorrelated with another component, every other component, and they all have unit variance. But if you multiply it by S, they're still all uncorrelated with each other, but they no longer have unit variance. And that's what you need to do if you don't want the noise to dominate your signal. Great. Thank you so much. I think that was a helpful uh, explanation for people that um, do not know what that is. Um, OK, next question is by Hao Ding. Um, why do we still select PCA um, to neural data, although we know that nonlinearities exist in it. Oh, OK. So why do we select PCAs to analyze neural data, despite the fact that we know that this might be uh, nonlinear data? Uh, we don't necessarily you... know what the nonlinearities uh, are at the population level. And um, PCA is very intuitive and uh, has like a a solution that you can easily calculate that you don't need to do like a numerical approximation for. Um, and it's I, at some level, um, I personally prefer like the like the devil I understand to the devil I don't understand. So I I would always start with PCA if I'm just doing visualization. Um, I mean that's that's not and the other reason is because uh, depending on your data, it can be very noisy and sometimes nonlinear methods are very uh, very sensitive to that noise. Can I agree with that? But, uh... You know, um, nonlinear always sounds better, but linear to understand. So I think it always start with linear, and we don't know which nonlinearities. And I want, also wanted to add something to whitening, because I think there's another reason we're interested in whitening, which is, for instance, that we think the retina essentially to first order performs whitening on its images. So we think not just that we use whitening as a way to process data, but we actually also think that whitening is something that's behind us in various instances. So first approximation, and that I think lends extra interest in you know types of methods. That's an interesting uh, perspective. Yeah, um, it, 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 so the 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 the, um, the 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 why do we select linear um, analysis methods for potentially nonlinear data? Also applied to uh, yesterday's tutorial. Of course, you have seen the the GLMs, right? And and we got similar questions about that. And 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 one of the answers you can give is that well, even in nonlinear relationships, you typically have a very dominant linear component. And all these analysis techniques essentially allow you to at least get that part out. OK. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on just that. Before we move on, can, can I just once again say how important what Alex said is? That with, with, with PCA, you know what you're doing. right? You know exactly how it works. Yeah. And it's just about the only method that, that people really understand exactly what they're doing. So, so if you're going to, for example, if you're going to do a confirmatory analysis, uh, if you're going to test a hypothesis, using PCA maybe is not quite so dangerous. But, but when you start using nonlinear methods, you know, it's an algorithm that you run it twice, you get two different answers. Um, so you just don't really understand what it's doing so well. 
But with, with PCA, you really understand it. So I think what Alex said there is, is really important for everyone to take on board. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, OK, next question is by Hao Ding. I'm going to paraphrase slightly. Um, so why are big variations um, viewed as signal and small variations viewed as noise in PCA? They don't have to be, but I mean, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they are. <laughs> or you might want to redo your experiment. <laughs> but this is an excellent question, right? There's, there's definitely data where this is not the case, where you throw out the first few principal components because you know they are noise and the signal is embedded somewhere deeper. Oh, but that's, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. You'll be throwing out some of the signal with the noise if you do that. Yeah, I agree. It depends so, a lot on the system that you're studying, actually. So I think if we apply PCA to, say, uh, firing rates or population or something like that, then the underlying assumption is that, you know, the bulk of spikes that are being fired, that's the thing that is important. But it's very important that this is an underlying assumption. Because, you know, maybe in your population you have just one cell that, you know, projects into a very specific area and does something very important that will totally be squeezed out by PCA, but it could be very important for the behavior of the organism, right? There's always the assumption that there's like this sort of bulk population activity that is maybe changing over time and that that is the thing that with PCA you're extracting. But obviously, that doesn't necessarily have to be the most important thing for the brain in all circumstances, right? That can be, especially if there are a few neurons that do something important, you will not find them with PCA. You need a different type of analysis in that case. So I think that's a really important point as well. So. It, um, to, just to maybe phrase the same thing in a different way, um, PCA is rotationally invariant, it, meaning that you can take your data, you do any rotation in the high dimensional space, it doesn't matter, uh, you get the same answer. Okay, there's reasons to think that brain activity doesn't have that same property, and that's that the brain is made of physical neurons, um, and if you've got, so, so the activity at any time, the firing rate of every one of those neurons is positive or it's non-negative, it can't be less than zero. And after you rotate, that's no longer the case. So the the, the brain is is in some ways not like PCA in, in that it has this non-negativity constraint. And there's another method of dimensionality reduction, which is just to take a subset of neurons. If you, if you suppose you're looking at, um, you know, encoding of a visual stimulus, another method of dimensionality reduction is to take the N neurons that best encode that visual stimulus. And that's a very different method. And there are reasons to think that in some circumstances this is, that's better because, uh, uh, you know, for, for example, in um, an experiment we did looking at um, uh, 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 decision coding, we found that the number of neurons uh, that um, encode information about a decision is actually a very small fraction of the total. And if you've got a case like that, where there's just a small number of neurons encoding a signal, and you apply PCA, you'll lose the signal altogether. It'll it'll be apparent noise, but it's actually it's actually not. So so these other methods, based on selecting a small number of neurons, um, are, are another alternative. And and I don't know, Alex, whether you, you covered those today: sparse methods, lasso, etc. Uh, no. Okay, no. so this. Uh, I'd say for people, if you, if you got if you get a chance, this is worth uh, reading about um, methods uh, such as the lasso, L A S S O, which is a way of predicting um, variable y from a number of variables x, and what it ends up doing is selecting just a small subset of those variables x and predicting from those, and setting all the other weights to zero. And, and it's kind of, it, it's very different philosophy to PCA. It's not that one's always better, one's worse. Ah, somebody says you did do it yesterday, that's good. Um, it's not that one's always better, one's always worse, but but they're, they're alternatives worth thinking about. Great, thank you. Um, oh, Christian, do you wanna add something to that? Uh, no, I think that's totally okay. the right thing to say. Just wanna make sure. <laughs> Great. Um, so we have another question by Emma Jones about specifically about the tutorial. So I guess this is for you, Alex. Um, when using PCA for denoising in tutorial three, 
we um, projected the noisy data onto the basis vectors found with the original not noisy data set and then reconstructed the data using the top n principal components. In practice, you wouldn't have the original data set from which to calculate the base, basis vectors. Are there real world cases where this denoising method is applicable? Would one instead do PCA on the noisy data and reconstruct the data having removed principal components that, for example, likely correspond to artifacts? This is a good question. This is something that we actually, uh, I discussed with the day chief um, about which way would be fairer. Um, and uh, in this example that like that was in the tutorial, you would basically be assuming that you already had some data that was noise free and then you maybe got another sample that had been noise corrupted. Um, I think that's really not the case in neuroscience where typically like all the data you get is noisy. Um, but you could still do a denoising. I mean, you can do that with the uh, just basically use the noisy data to get the uh, to get the basis vectors. Um, it doesn't work as well, but it still denoises a bit. Um, so I guess the short answer uh, is that I don't think it's actually uh, the standard case for neuroscience. I think for neuroscience, we we uh, have noisy data. We find the noisy uh, basis vectors. But for other you know other fields, I think it could be useful. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from uh, Francesco Sacadura. Um, Francesco asks, is there any principled or unbiased way to estimate intrinsic dimensionality in a neural manifold? It sort of relates a little bit back to our discussion about dimensionality earlier, I guess. Yeah. Alex, you want to give it a go? Um, I think it's really hard for the reasons that Ken said, that it, it's not that your data, uh, I mean, it would be easy if, if the data was truly k-dimensional um, and truly lying on like a k-dimensional hyperplane or hy manifold. Um, but the problem is that typically there's some variance that extends uh, like in every direction. And so that's why like in the example lectures that I show, you see kind of a more graded decrease. You don't just see like a kink at at zero, like everything goes to zero and then you have no more variance in those directions. Um, so uh, one way is to use the eigenvalue participation ratio. Honestly, I don't, I don't really think that there's a real answer to this. I think it's just a difficult question. So you can use the participation ratio or you can uh, use the number of components required for a fraction of your data, either one. Can, can I add to that? It's difficult enough for the case of a linear manifold, which is where you can use things like the participation ratio. But if you're talking about a non-linear manifold, then it gets exponentially harder. Also, you're on spike. So, you know, strictly speaking, when we compute something like uh, uh, the manifold on PCA, we often start with spiking data, we smooth the spiking data, um, and then we talk about manifolds. So there are all these pre-processing steps in between. Um, so I would also say manifold is just an approximation to some different underlying ground truth. Can I can I maybe uh, um, ask like a related question um, that is more philosophical? So so when typically we have data that where there are certain tasks, so maybe there's not a particular tasks, but it, I mean the data set is always self-contained, right? And 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 then we're trying to essentially tease out you know signal among potentially noise. So how do you figure out what, what part is signal and what part is noise? I think Can you define noise before we go there? Sorry, say again? How, how do you define signal and noise before we even answer the question? Right. So, so I mean, one way to say is that the signal is anything that is actually um, related to the task, right? To a task. So, so what if? No, go on, Alex. Well, um, uh, well, if it's if you have a particular task, if you have some particular variables that you're interested in, then you can look for you can basically do regression, right? So in that case, uh, that's I think how you could choose. That's yeah. a simple answer. So, yeah. so, so I think expanding on that, uh, Alex, are you, are you saying that that you would take? 
the regression uh, prediction, and that's what you call the signal, and the residual is what you call the noise. Uh, I mean, but that's, yeah, but that's only if you're like, I mean, I, I don't actually personally feel comfortable calling that noise. That's just like everything that's orthogonal yeah. to like what you're yeah. measuring. Um, but if you're going to define signal as uh, in that way, then that's how you would uh, do that, yes. But, but even in that, even with that definition, I mean, there's questions like suppose um, every time, um, you, you know, you give me a task and, and every time the stimulus comes on, I scratch my ear. Um, is that, and now you find a neuron that fires at that moment, you might think it was related to the signal, to, to the stimulus. So uh, even, even with that definition, it, it, I think is hard to say what signal and noise. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, then I guess that's the poverty of the behavioral um, uh, recording that you have. It, right. If we recorded all of the um, um, motor uh, variables, but but then taking it one step further, suppose every um, time you present the stimulus, I think, God, I really can't wait till this is over. Um, and then there's a neuron that just responds to that thought. I, I mean, I, I, I personally, my, my opinion is that in, um, uh, in decades from now, people will look back on these discussions of signal and noise in the same way in that hypothetical example of whether dinosaurs are reptiles, you know, so I find it useful to distinguish a bit the perspective of the experimenter from the perspective of the animal. So I think from the experimenter's perspective, it's very easy to define noise and signal. Because you know you have maybe a task that you're running, and then you study you know, how it correlated with signals in the brain. So you say that's the signal, and then everything with variability around that is noise. So that's I think, you know, just kind of definitions in the experiments. It gets much harder, and I think this is where we struggle, when we try to understand what's the signal, what's noise for the animal, right? Then it's, then it's kind of hard, because, you know, from the animal's perspective, what is signal, what is noise? The animal has different uh, knowledge of the experiment and the experimenter. The task the experimenter on may not even be the task the animal thinks it's solving, right? And variability that we see may be part of the task from the animal's perspective. And like nice studies, uh, um, I don't remember where they're from, now, but uh, where they're kind of showing, you know, these animals sometimes have superstitious behavior, so they start, you know, moving in ways that have nothing to do with the task, for instance, right? So for the animal, that's all signal in that task, but from the experimenter's point of view, you know, it may just be noise. Hmm. And, and I guess as an experimenter, there is always the problem that you have uncontrolled manifolds that you have not manipulated experimentally, explicitly at least, and and now all of a sudden they could they can largely influence behavior, um, and and therefore the neural activity. But you, you you don't have a means of actually teasing that out. So so as an experimentalist, we often call that noise, but it might not be noise if you dig deeper. So so we had this question earlier this week, uh, um, um, more of a philo philosophical question: how you figure these things out. That's why I brought it back up because I thought it was kind of related into in this discussion. So thank you so much for uh, for giving us your opinions. Okay, next question is by uh, Luciano. How does TSNE actually work? <laughs> I think I, th I think Luciano might be asking for the for the sort of intuition. Of what, like, does anyone want to give it a try? I would be curious too, actually, to know. I'm not an avid Tiffany user, so I'm not going to answer that question. Right. Um, so you can tell this is a question no one really wants to answer, which I think probably means none of us really know. But um, despite that, I'll do my best. Um, uh, roughly speaking, which is the limit of the answer I can give, at least, the, the point is that you, you want to put points together in your two-dimensional space that were close together in the high dimensional space. So um, you start by um, uh, measuring a distance for every pair of points 
uh, in the high dimensional space. Um, and then you, and then that's the only part of the data you keep, right? So you've got some flexibility in terms of what that distance measure is. It could be the Euclidean distance. It could be some other, other measure of similarity. Anyway, so you've thrown away all of your data except this pairwise distance between every pair of points. Then what TSNE and, and many other algorithms, including multidimensional scaling, an old one, UMAP, a much newer one, um, what all these algorithms do is they search for arrangements of the points um, in a two-dimensional space so that the, um, uh, the, the, the distance between the, the points in two-dimensional space is in some way correlated with the original distance in the high dimensional space. Uh, and exactly what that relationship is, is what determines these different algorithms, such as GSNE. Uh, PCA is actually an example of this sort of an algorithm as well. Um, uh, uh, GSNE, multi-dimensional scaling, uh, large viz, UMAP, there are many, many different algorithms and, and they really just come down to differences in this precise definition of how you measure the similarity uh, between the distances in the low dimensional and high dimensional spaces. That's absolutely right. And I just wanted to add that there are also other methods that take not just local information into account, but uh, global information like ISOMAP, um, which takes like uh, geodesic distances between points. Cool, thank you. Okay, um, next question is by Samuel Picard um, asking principal components or other basis functions that explain large amounts of variance in the data are not necessarily the most interesting components because they may relate to something relatively trivial, for example, a slow drift. Um, how do we make sure that potentially interesting components don't get drowned in the noise from the most obvious ones? So it's similar to a question we had earlier, but I think there's a bit of a spin on it in terms of uh, uh, the data analysis component. How do, you, how do you make sure we don't miss out if, if we, you know, when we look at the, the results of the PCA? Who would like to give that a shot? Well, again, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, so the, the first thing is, if your hope is to have an algorithm that you feed in your data, and it automatically pulls out the quantities of scientific interest for your particular scientific question. Uh, there is no such algorithm that will reliably do that or, or even ever do that. I mean, occasionally you, you read papers where they say that this method uh, magically pulls out the quantities of, of scientific interest. Over optimistic. Um, you, so, there are so many of these different methods, you know, ICA, uh, DPCA and discriminant analysis, you explicitly tell it what you're looking for, and that, that can help if you know what you're looking for. Um, but if you don't know what you're looking for, it's just really searching around in the, in the dark. So, so really, I think a, 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 maybe a different way of thinking about it is um, if you've got this high dimensional data, the other way of thinking about it is, how much of it can I afford to throw away without worrying that I'm throwing away some signal? So returning to this example of, of, the, um, of the wide field imaging, um, if, if, you, if you do this uh, PCA, you see that the first dimensions look very spatially structured. But as you go down to dimension 1,000, it just looks like noise. It looks like speckles everywhere. And that's how you know it. You no longer really need those ones. So you'd keep, say, a few hundred dimensions uh, just to be on the safe side that you're not throwing away any signal. Uh, but, it, but if you're hoping for something that magically pulls out the quantity of scientific interest while throwing out everything else, I, do, I don't think such a thing exists. Yeah. Always think about what you're doing. There's, there's, no, there's no like automatic analysis, despite that some people might 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 want to have that, of course. But that would make science like really, really boring, right? Like if you, you cannot think about the problems anymore and, and, and have the, the luxury of interpreting and, and 
hauling around ideas and trying them out. So, so, so luckily we, we don't say, have to do that. <laughs> you can say that the lack of such an algorithm is uh, job security. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I, I saw something once from a mathematician, pure mathematician working on theorem, automated theorem provers, about how this is his plan for early retirement. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. We're a long way off in neuroscience. <laughs> well, there's also a whole, a whole field, I guess, in machine learning about uh, automated uh, model discovery, right? Um, where you essentially fit whole classes of models and then try to, to, to select the best one from there. And, and and ultimately, you can think that you can push that to the limit and say, like, well, I, I'm going to always fit all classes of models that I can think of, at least. And, and that might be part of automated um, model discovery. But of course, the complexity of that is like exponentially exploding very rapidly. So I don't think that will ever be really doable without some big, big priors. And then we get into the same problem again of, you know, if we put priors in, then we probably get like priors out. OK. Um, the no free lunch theorem. No free lunch theorem. Very important theorem. Probably the most important theorem out there ever, like just in, in, in general for life as well. <laughs> well you know, lit literally, there is a theorem of machine learning saying yeah. called, called that, which says um, that if you, if you, there, there is no such thing as a general learning algorithm. That, that, if if you have an algorithm that can learn everything, it will learn, learn nothing. Okay. Um, next question is by Amiretsa Farbashk, Far, Farbaksh. Sorry. Um, are dimensions and manifolds used just uh, used just for modeling, or is there meaningful concept about them in the brain itself? What is the importance of the dimensionality of the manifold in the brain? Also, if there is such a concept. Do the decoder circuits in the brain use something similar to dimensionality reduction? If they do, do they um, re do reduced features even exist in the first place? Well, I would say you know they are only used for modeling because we don't understand how the brain works. So it's a concept of thinking about the brain, right? Dimensions and manifolds. We use them in data analysis. We also use them in neural network modeling. And I think it's useful because this way you can try to try to match your network models and your data analysis a bit. You have like similar concepts from which you can move from one to the other. But it's all just theory at this point, I would say. You know, I think it's useful theory, but we can't you know, 100% prove that that's the way the brain operates. And there are researchers who totally disagree and think it all works very different. Yeah, I, th I think this is a really deep question. I mean, maybe one one thought is if you had something like a, a ring attractor or a line attractor, then then you ought to have a low dimensional nonlinear manifold. Um, and and you know maybe uh, you know to take the recent paper from Ila Fiat's lab on on head direction cells, where they saw something that really does look quite a lot like a one-dimensional manifold for head direction cells. And they, and you have this model that there's a ring attractor for them. So so in that case, maybe you've got something coming together in, in that way. But, but for, for something like sensory processing of high dimensional uh, natural image data, there are reasons to suspect there won't be a, a low dimensional manifold because why should there be anything like a ring attractor um, for processing of high-dimensional data. But on the, on the other hand, you can argue that the brain extracts specific statistics of um, the images, right? And that we have learned and we know that, that we are more sensitive to the natural statistics, for example, of images than to artificial images. And so in that sense, that, that would be a, a, a form of dimensionality reduction. Oh, certainly. So, I mean, if, if you take an image, then if you take a random image, it looks like video snow. It looks like white noise. Natural images are such a tiny fraction of, of the space of all possible images that, that absolutely they do have a lower dimensionality, um, but it's still quite a high dimensionality. I mean, the other way around would be to think about a motor system, right? The brain has many more potential um, actions it can produce than it actually produces. And so 
and 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 mean a lot of lot of more neurons and, and populations of neurons in the brain that work together in producing a specific action. So in a way, you can you can say, well, there's a high dimensional neural space that gets reduced down to the particular movement at some point th simply through convergence in terms of the motor pathways. But again, this is sort of like a philosophical question, and 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 anyone might um, disagree with my statement just now because it's it's really the way you think about this. Does anyone want to add something to this? I really like that question. Okay, then let's move on. Um, Hao Jing asks, um, why computing eigenvectors of covariance matrix will give us a proper orthogonal angle of basis vectors? Ah, very technical question. Um, sorry, why computing the, you get an, um orthogonal basis, that's the question? Yeah, why do you get an orthogonal basis? Um, it's symmetric. It falls out the fact that the covariance matrix is symmetric. Yeah. I mean, this is this is sort of uh, a little bit of basic uh, matrix algebra. Um, it's, it's actually quite beautiful. If you don't know this, I really recommend looking a little bit into it. There's all kinds of like very nice um, properties that that fall out that, that underlie essentially um, these kind of um, 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 statements. So this is in the tutorial two. I th I, there's an optional video on this somewhere in the tutorial. Oh, great. I'll go over great. this. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Um, Daniel Wolf, uh, David Wolf, sorry, asked, when using TSNE on data, how do we decide on an optimal perplexity value? We've sort of already um, talked about this a little bit. Um, any, 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 any further advice you would like to give? The creator of TSNE actually, he has a website where he's addressed all of these like questions about how to interpret TSNE um, and, uh, and how to choose the perplexity. I think I looked at it, it said, choose something between two and 50. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember. Um, uh, but yeah, just varying it. Uh, yeah. And uh, seeing how it changes, I think is important. Close your eyes and hope for the best. Sounds about right. OK. Um, uh, Yushin Zhang asks, after PCA, what can we infer about, what can I infer about my variables from the principal components? Can I say they are correlated? Also, can I project different types of variables onto the PC space? Say I calculate PCA with neural spikes and project some behavioral data onto these PCs. Well, if you have behavioral data, it won't be in the same vector space. So I struggle to see how you would project it onto basis vectors in the neural data space. Possibly something you could do is um, if you've got neural versus time and you've got behavior versus time, you could then make the covariance matrix of neural and behavior um, and take the eigenvectors of, of that. Uh, I don't think that would be called literally PCA. Um, that's more like um, canonical correlation analysis, mm -hmm. reduced rank regression, and partial least squares, which is a whole other set of algorithms when, when you start with not one data matrix, but two data matrices, and you want to find the dimensions of maximal correlation between two sets of, of high dimensional data. So possibly that would be a way to get at this uh, question. Great, thank you. Um, last one maybe before we, we wrap up. Um, what is the geometrical relationship between linear regression and PCA? Kenneth, it sounds well, like a question for you. <laughs> for who? For you. Oh, for me, okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it's quite a lot like the last question. I mean, so, so linear regression is when you want to predict y from x. Um, PCA is when you only have x. So um, they're, they're very different types of questions. Um, and, and there's not really that much of a relationship, I think. 
Although, I mean, something you can do is, and, and, and it's often a very good idea, is to run PCA on X before you predict Y from X. Yeah, some people would argue that this is not not a good way of doing things because you're uh, you're you're pre-selecting certain variables and and you're sort of like biasing your uh, um, uh, your results towards confirmatory. But but that's maybe a different discussion that, that 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 we can have. But I mean, the important point here really is that that all these techniques that you, and you will learn many many more all over the next couple of weeks. You really have to know. Um, for each of and every one of them, when you can use them and what kind of answers they can give you. So I, 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 I wanted to ask that last question essentially, exactly to highlight this um, this point, which is that the, the important part, and this is all that Neuromatch Academy is, is should really be about for for most of you, is not to learn the intricate details of a method, but rather to get to appreciate what a particular method can buy you. Um, and what the limitations of a particular method are, because this is super, super important. You can throw any method at any, well, not, not any data set, but at a lot of um, different data sets. But that doesn't mean that you can get any meaningful answers out of that. So the first thing you need to think about is a meaningful question. And then you have to select the appropriate techniques, the appropriate toolkit, right, in the how-to model tutorials, um, that allows you to answer those questions. And for each toolkit, you need to know what are the limitations, like how far can I push my interpretation here, and when do I have to stop because the technique can just simply not tell me anything about that. So I think that's 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 super important and 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 in it um, grants some uh, some. Uh, Highlighting again. Okay, so with that, we're coming. We're at the end of the hour. Um, maybe I can ask our panelists to um, maybe share some last wise words um, with us um, about dimensional dimensionality reduction, or maybe about the research approach in general, or Neuromatch Academy, whatever you feel like. Um, Alex, you want to start? Oh, um, Sorry. well, <laughs> uh, I guess you kind of already said it, but really, um, yeah, dimensionality reduction is just a tool. Um, and uh, the really hard part is not understanding like uh, how a particular method works, but first understanding what question you're trying to answer, and then you select the method. Or if you can't find the right method, maybe you can make your own. Great. Um, Christian. Yeah, I want to say, um, you know, I think it's important to go for uh, methods you understand and that are potentially simple. Don't go for the doer of your know, most fancy and newest method. I remember giving a lot of talks about PCA, and quite often in the audience, I would get afterwards the question, you know, why don't you use ICA? Like 10 you know, or 15 years back. And I think the, the context was always, you know, ICA came after PCA, so ICA must be better. But that's totally the wrong way of thinking about it. But don't think, you know, you have to look for the newest method. Don't try to make something fancy by going for a new and fancy method. Really think rather about the problem that you have and then go for the simplest method, the most conservative method. Fine, start there. Great. Thanks so much. Kenneth. Yeah, I really want to second that point. It's so important. Uh, the PCA in particular, you, you know what you're doing. Uh, and, and another thing to add is always use multiple methods. Um, or or if, you, if you're gonna only use one, then make it PCA. Uh, but if you're gonna use more than one, always make sure you use PCA as well uh, and, and make sure you use multiple methods. Just from my own experience, way back when we were doing uh, population recordings in auditory cortex, we ran PCA and we ran another method, uh, discriminant analysis, and got completely different answers. They just looked utterly different. And, and, and I think that's a really important lesson, which is that these dimensionality reduction methods that you use, um, they, um, you know, th th they will give you different answers. So, so use them, help, let them help you get an intuition about your data, but don't think that this is is the, the, the fundamental reality. It's just a small view of a much more complicated reality. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, sharing your wisdom with us. That was very enjoyable for me. I hope you had a good time, too. And uh, see you again soon.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Real, real honor to be at Neuromatic, it really is. <laughs>